This post caught my attention. A Reddit user posted pictures of a mysterious Raspberry Pi Zero. He wrote that his roommate found a bunch of these hidden behind desks, vending machines and trash cans in the college library. Some people were speculating a Wi-Fi dongle attached and used to intercept internet traffic. Looks like a Pi he was using it as a rogue access point to do a man in the middle attack. Yep, definitely. So I reached out to them and offered my help to figure out what it does. And to my surprise they were interested and we hopped onto a Skype call. So in this video I want to tell you the process of us analyzing this Raspberry Pi Zero and how we figured out what it does. Before I joined this fun, they already took the SD card out of the Raspberry Pi and plugged it into a PC. This caused an F drive to show up. It's called boot and contains some weird files that can be really confusing. They first thought it's encrypted stuff, but they quickly realized that maybe Windows is not the best operating system to look at this. Actually, when you open the Windows Disk Management utility, you can see that the F drive is only one partition on this whole removable disk, and there are 3.6GB in another partition. But Windows didn't mount this. Windows only automatically mounted and made the file system accessible for the first partition called boot. That file system was FAT32. The file allocation table FAT is a computer file system. The FAT file system is a legacy file system and proves to be simple and robust. If you are a Windows user, you definitely have seen FAT before. It's very simple and very old, so a lot of systems support that. And so it's used for the boot partition of the Raspberry Pi. Also, Google is your best friend if you are confused by those files here. You can simply pick one and Google it. You will quickly find this repository with that file and it looks exactly like that on the partition. And as you can see, this is part of the official Raspberry Pi firmware repository. This repository contains pre-compiled binaries of the current Raspberry Pi kernel and modules, user space libraries and bootloader GPU firmware. Because we are looking here for whatever this Raspberry Pi does, these files are mostly uninteresting. They are just part of the Raspberry Pi system and we can ignore them. However, when you are very careful, you might notice that there is one weird file, vites.txt, and it contains the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth MAC address. We didn't know what to make from it, just keep the name in the back of your mind, it will come up again. So our goal was it to look at the second partition and the issue why Windows can't mount it is because it's very likely a typical Linux file system like ext4. The ext4 or fourth extended file system is a journaling file system for Linux developed as the successor to x3. And Windows just doesn't have file system drivers to understand that file system. Those bits and bytes on there just don't make sense for Windows. Because I was in a Skype call with this guy, we first tried to make this work on his Windows machine and we found and downloaded a program called X2FSD, hoping it would allow Windows to mount it, but it later said that it can't process X4, so that didn't work. Of course we also thought about different options. Either we try to create an image of the SD card and upload it so I can have a look at it on a Linux machine, or he could install a Linux virtual machine. Before we install a full VM, we tried the Windows Linux subsystem where you get kind of like a Ubuntu VM inside of Windows and I thought that could then just mount it. Then we thought about using DD in Linux to create an image, but nope, the drives are not exposed and accessible from in there. This was all so frustrating. Okay, so I guess we have to download a tool for Windows to create an image of this D card. I did a quick Google search for Windows DD alternatives and I found this image burner tool, hoping it could just create the damn image from the card. And now something very embarrassing happened. So when downloading that tool, we made sure to use the site's own mirror so we don't get malware bundled software from these shady mirrors. And when he installs it, this happened. Next, 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 installed, executed, Search manager added, uh, oops, this doesn't look good. <laughs> Virus threat protection, doing a quick scan and one threat's found. Cleaning that up, hopefully. We are so dumb, I'm such an idiot. Later during editing, I actually noticed that we just clicked next, next, next when the installer asked if we want to install that crapware. 
I feel so embarrassed. I'm supposed to be a security professional here and I just made some computer science student install some malware. And even I fall for these shitty tools once in a while out of frustration. I'm so sorry that I did that to your laptop. And it turns out this tool is crap and can't create image from the disk anyway. God damn it. Then I had some other idea. Maybe the git bash comes with DD. I remember that git for windows comes with a nice bash terminal where you get a lot of Linux tools. So I made him install that and to my surprise it does list the drives in dev as sda, sdb and so forth. And it also has DD. Awesome. DD is a command line utility for Unix and Unix-like operating systems whose primary purpose is to convert and copy files. But here comes the cool thing. On Unix, device drives for hardware such as hardware drives appear in the file system just like normal files. Thus DD can also read and or write from to these files. As a result, DD can be used for tasks such as backing up the boot sector of a hard drive. I'll link an older video from me where I talk a bit more about Linux files as well. But what this means is we can use DD and then specify the correct device drive, in our case SDC, as in file. So SDC is the whole drive and SDC1 and SDC2 are the two single partitions. But let's take an image of the whole card. The input file IF is the SDC drive and as out file OF we can write a SD.image file somewhere. And then he uploaded it for me and then I downloaded it. All of that took quite a while because it's a full like 7 gigabyte image of the whole disk. Anyway, so here I have it now on my Linux. The first thing I did was using fdisk. For computer file systems, fdisk is a command line utility that provides disk partitioning functions. As we know, the SD card contains two partitions, so fdisk can help us understand the raw bits and bytes of that SD image file to understand the partitions and it finds two. It also specifies at what exact sectors inside of the SD image this particular partition starts and ends. A sector is simply a unit of 512 bytes and now you can also understand why you can't easily move or insert partitions in front of another because they are at fixed places in there on that disk at exactly this offset. So now we are going to mount that second file system. To do this we have to find the byte offset so we can take the sector offset from fdisk times the sector size in bytes and this is it. Then we use the mount command to create a loop device from this particular SD images byte offset. A loop device is like a virtual or pseudo device that doesn't physically exist. We could also write that partition onto a real disk like a USB stick and then plug it in and mount it or we use that loop feature. And we tell the mount command to mount it into the folder partition 2. So now it will take the SD image file and understands it as if it was a disk that was just plugged in. And Ubuntu automatically noticed that a new file system got mounted and opens the file explorer of that device. See here, the device now shows up as rootfs, the name of that partition was root file system. When we look at these folders we can already tell this is a typical Linux file system. Here are well known folders like bin, dev, etc, home, lib, media, mnt, opt and so forth. We also can immediately see a tshark.txt file. tshark is a network protocol analyzer like wireshark just as command line tool. So were the people right? Does this try to sniff and man in the middle Wi-Fi connection? Is this a malicious device? So now we need to find out how it works. This is actually just a bit of boring detective work. We have here a Linux system and we have to look for programs that could run here. But like with the boot partition, here experience really helps. If you know how a typical Linux file system looks like, you can just ignore that stuff and directly look for non-typical files. And looking at locations where a developer might have placed the programs that are executed on here. You could also directly look for scripts and config files that determine what will be automatically executed on start. All this is just experience you acquire over time if you work on Linux. So I start with the home folder. When you log in as a user, this is your default folder. So maybe important or interesting files are located there. And we can then immediately find a clean.sh script. That is definitely not a standard Linux file. And here we can see a system control call to stop the bytes service. You remember that name, right? So there is a systemd service called bytes running. 
There are also other interesting paths here, which are definitely worth investigating too. But before we moved on, we thought that Weitz is maybe the person's nickname. So we did a quick Google search for things like a potential GitHub profile, but no luck. Now that we know there is a service called Weitz and Weitz appears to be an important string, we can search for files and folders with that name. And it reveals that there is a folder in home, pi, hub code, bin, com, Weitz, and there are Java classes in here. So com.vites.hub.scanning blah are typical Java paths. This is a Java program. And look at those class names. Command listener, network thread, channel hopper, Wi-Fi data, Wi-Fi packet, Bluetooth packet, Bluetooth reader, shell command thread. Whoa, okay. At this point, I was wondering if Hubcode is maybe a known tool that people use. So we can Google for names and snippets like that and search on GitHub directly, but nothing shows up. So then the detective work continues. Let's look at some of these files here. The state.txt turned out to be interesting. There is a Wi-Fi command specified with a TCP dump, so a packet reading dump of the WLAN 1 interface. There is also a flood 1 config and maybe some BT Bluetooth settings. Hmm, really suspicious. Here we also find systemd writes a service configuration file. Systemd will use this config file to automatically start the service described in here. The name is writes MQTT service. Huh? I know MQTT, it's a machine to machine connectivity protocol. It was designed as an extremely lightweight publish subscribe message transport. It is useful for connections with remote locations. For example, it has been used in sensors communicating and in a range of home automation and small device scenarios. It kind of would make sense because the person said that there were multiple Raspberry Pis scattered around the library, hidden in various places. And so maybe MQTT is used to create a distributed network of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth things for whatever purpose. Well, we can also learn from the systemd service config here that the following script is executed on start, service.sh. And in there, there are a few interesting comments. Get device information, download bundle, unzipping bundle, blah, looks like an update mechanism. And when that is done, it will call the hub code script start.sh. And look at that one. This prints starting Vites service script. It will make sure that the system has T Shark installed, then it will call T Shark on the WLAN 1 interface, and it also seems to get some broker credentials. Broker is a term from MQTT, so this again reinforces that MQTT is in fact used here. And then later, the Java application is executed, the Vites hub production program, and it even sets an include path for a MQTT library. So yep, okay, there is some MQTT communication going on. We can also have a look at the get creds Python script because credentials are always cool and it will use the Amazon API to get them. But to do so, you need to know those parameters sent along the request. And in the gen token module, we should be able to find those parameters. And then module will actually execute a script called fingerprint.sh and take the output as a secret and then calculate like a secret token. CLC 32 of the secret plus the current time. Okay. My code audit inner self is screaming loud right now because I see what they try to do here, but they use CRC 32 with a secret concatenated to the time. My chest hurts. They actually want to use HMAC instead. But in the end, it doesn't matter too much because while the fingerprint is like a unique hardware ID based on the Bluetooth Mac, the Wi-Fi Mac and the Pi serial number, this is not perfect. Anybody with access to such a Raspberry Pi can easily extract or possibly even guess those values because none of these are really random. So because anybody with physical access can always extract those tokens, I suggest to just use a pre-shared secret unique to each device like an API token. It can be compromised, but you can also then revoke access to that particular API token. This little bit of obfuscation here is useless for anybody who actually wants to do harm and figure out the secret. It just takes like one minute longer to get it, but adds unnecessary development complexity. You actually can't do this better with a Raspberry Pi. It's not a secure hardware device. Anyway. We were going basically slowly through all scripts and codes. At some point even used JDGoy to look at the Java classes to understand what they are doing. 
I mean, at this point, it's just like reading code of any program project. It's just like a code audit or getting familiar with a new project. You just have to know how to read code and how software projects might be structured and deployed. Our main goal was to determine if this is a malicious actor who wanted to attack or sniff Wi-Fi of students in the library or if this is a harmless school project. So we spent maybe one or two hours on looking around, reading those files and slowly assembled a mysterious puzzle of what this is. So fast forward a bit. We slowly realized that it doesn't do much. It does not collect any packet data or trying to sniff passwords or whatever. Actually it just logs MAC addresses that it finds from Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices in the area. This is to 99% just to track people. This is a very typical application. Probably every public place you go has stuff like this. Probably most shopping malls or airports do that. It helps to automatically record how busy areas are and how people are moving through a building. This is very valuable data for businesses. They don't care about the individual person, it's just to understand the flow of people. So this is probably doing a similar thing. One other thing we did was we knew the Raspberry Pi Zero has Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi dongle is actually a dual band and offers two Wi-Fi interfaces. So if it is monitoring Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in the area, it probably would also use the second Wi-Fi to connect to the school's Wi-Fi to use MQTT and send away the data. So we thought it would be interesting to find the username and password they are using to connect to the Wi-Fi. So I can easily search for that files on the Raspberry Pi. He told me the name of the school and the name of the school's Wi-Fi. He is from UCSD. And like I often do, I Google stuff. And for whatever reason, I decided to Google Vites USD to see if there is any connection. And this Reddit thread pops up. UCSD, the name of the school, Vites. Did they stop supporting the app? Now listen to this beautiful reaction. Whoa, 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 what? and we find this website. Is this it? <laughs> what does Vites do? Vites reports real-time busyness for locations around campus. How does Vites work? Vites gathers our data through small hardware devices. These devices pick up smartphone signals in the area around them. We then normalize these signals to reach a busyness measurement. Don't waste time, know before you go. So this was just part of a network to give students indication how busy certain areas at the school are. Actually, that's a really cool and useful project. But oh man. Oh my god. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> you found it. Okay, I guess I'll contact them and say I found one of their things. And you know what makes the whole story even more beautiful? There was actually a comment nine hours before we figured it out on the original thread on Reddit. Please return this to the library. This is property of Vites. It isn't nefarious. It is extremely basic and giving you an idea of how many people are in the library. Vites was started by a recent graduate who did this project while enrolled at the university. This was so much fun. 